ओके वेरी गुड इवनिंग फ्रेंड्स मुंबई एंड गुड मॉर्निंग टाइम सो in fact uh, first of all let me say sorry to our visitors uh, uh, or audience because what happened there are 2600 or registrations for today's lecture and uh, it was difficult because we do has a limited capacity you know we cannot know we cannot get more than uh, 100 at a time so what was happening in fact pretty really it was a very different difficult situation for us when we started wanted to log in you know we were able to log in so neither me nor speaker nor so because people are already uh, uh, the login so we had to recreate the cancel the meeting i am really uh, my sincere apology for that okay but there was no way out and uh, since we are only behind the schedule by four minutes now uh welcome me dr minakshi babla uh, this is a special day and a very special location uh, let me just introduce her briefly in a very nice and then we'll try to use because moon landing because very nice questions asked but we have learned what why should go there why we should it but frankly speaking such a kind of mission such a kind of learned the law not only that there are a lot of space spin offs Uh, those who are perhaps going to inaugurate new or new space uh, as soon as the uh, pandemic will end and lockdown will be over, uh, you can come and see what we have gained out of such things. But we will learn what uh, from all different missions what we have learned from the uh, Minakshi. Uh, she is the director and professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Yosemite University. This group is best known for developing uh, novel technologies to investigate time scales of uh, processes in the solar system. After research, we need to understand the events and or reason for another one. On the basic policy of the solar system, Dr. Baba has been involved in a number of NASA planetary science missions, including as co-investigator. On the Genesis mission and as well as on the Mars science laboratory mission, she has taken part in expedition at the Antarctic Search for Meteorites program. She has been a participant in the launch. Doctor Madhu is a member of the NASA Advisory Council Planetary Science Subcommittee and the Preparation Subcommittee, and was chair of the NASA Curation and Analysis Planning Team for extraterrestrial materials. And uh, she also served as a member of uh, NASA's uh, study board and as a scientific commentator. She became a public figure physically in 2019. She was the the wings of Vulcan in 2007 and the Meteorological Society in 2006. She is currently serving as president of Meteorological Society. and uh, she is a respected uh, academy and professional level uh, they give him a uh, fellowship and the uh, new prize in recognition of her contribution to planetary science asteroid 8356 was named uh, 8356 wadwa by the international astronomical union uh, she earned her phd in planetary science from university in singapore with this i know or uh, if you will see uh, see it is almost uh, 29 pages so but we have this opportunity i will now take more time uh, first dr minakshi varma first of all we thank you for accepting our job uh, we are schedule and she has technically told at 8:30 to stop so over you dr minakshi varma please take over and start Well, th- thank you very much for that very um, um, kind introduction. Um, I hope you are actually able to uh, hear me okay because um, my connection was sort of breaking up when I was uh, when I was listening to you. Are you able to hear me okay? 
Okay. That's great. Okay, cool. wonderful. So, uh, no, thanks very much. This is a great honor for me to be making this presentation here for the Nehru Science Center in Mumbai. Uh, Mumbai is actually where I was born. And so the, this is a really kind of, um, you know, fantastic opportunity for me to, um, to be able to be part of this uh, wonderful celebration here today on a um, historic occasion, really. Today, July 20th, is when human beings first landed on the moon 52 years ago. And uh, so uh, what I'm gonna be talking about today is really telling you a little bit about um, all of the things that we've learned from some of the moon rocks that were brought back from those missions, the Apollo missions, uh, the first of which landed uh, on July 20th, 1969. Um, of course, I mean, this is the, the front page of the New York Times on, that, on the day after that event when uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin became the first uh, human beings to set foot on the moon. And since then, of course, you know, we've, uh, there's been, uh, there were at least six Apollo missions that collected more moon rocks, um, as well as uh, three uh, Soviet missions, the Luna missions that collected some samples as well. And then most recently, of course, China has brought back some samples from the moon. Um, the, uh, there was a spacecraft, a robotic spacecraft that landed last year in December, and they brought back something like 1.7 kilograms or something. So uh, I'll be today, of course, I mean, I'll, I'll talk, tell you a little bit about um, um, the moon as, as we know it, um, and a lot about what we've understood about its history and formation and origin from studying uh, materials that were brought back from the moon by these spacecraft missions, as well as some of the meteorites that we actually have from the moon at this point. So uh, just to sort of start out with some basic facts about the moon. Um, the interesting thing about the moon is that it's actually tidally locked with the earth, which means that it rotates about its own axis, um, taking about 27 earth days to do that. And then it revolves around the Earth in just about the same time period, so about 27 days again. And so we only ever see one face of the moon, which is the near side of the moon. We never see the far side. Uh, the diameter of the moon is about 34, 75 kilometers. And gravity is about one sixth that of the Earth because it is, of course, uh, significantly smaller than the Earth. Um, moon's mass is only about 1% of that of the Earth, which basically means that actually it has a very, very small core. Most of the Earth's density actually comes from its iron nickel dense core in the center, and, and the Moon has a very small one. Um, the distance between the Earth and the Moon is about 384,000 kilometers, and uh, the axis, its rotational axis is tilted about 1.5 degrees. We know that for the Earth, of course, it's tilted about 23 degrees. And so it's only slightly tilted relative to the Earth. Um, the surface area of the moon is about equivalent of the area of Africa in terms of its um, um, aerial um, uh, size, basically. Um, and then, of course, the other really intriguing thing about the moon is that its near side is actually very different from the far side. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute here. So just to sort of tell you a little bit about the big picture for the moon, um, uh, basically it's in the context of the formation history of our own solar system, which started about 4.56 billion years ago. Um, we know that uh, from studying the geochemistry of meteorites, as well as uh, other types of investigations that have been done, uh, we understand that the rocky planets, which means you know Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they began to form well within you know ten millions or tell me ten million years or so after the solar system started, um, and then. We also know from uh, geochemical studies of earth rocks as well as meteorites that the earth was actually fully formed, we think, within about 50 to 100 million years after the start of the solar system. So the big questions then, of course, are, you know, when did the moon form and how did it form? 
And what is the moon made of? Is it similar in bulk composition to the earth or is it different? And so those are sort of some of the big picture questions that we ask when we, um, when we want to try to understand the history and origin of the moon. Um, and we can do that because we actually have samples from the moon and that really, really changed everything in terms of being able to understand how the moon came about, when was it formed and what is it actually made from? And so, um, as I mentioned earlier, there were six Apollo missions. The first one, of course, landed on July 20th, 1969, the Apollo 11 mission. And then subsequent to that, there were five other Apollo missions, Apollo 12, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And this um, slide here actually shows on the left-hand side uh, in yellow, the uh, spots on the moon, the locations on the moon where the Apollo missions landed between 1969 and 1972. And they brought back something like 382 kilograms of lunar samples. And much of that material is, is still uh, preserved. And it's actually very well preserved and can be used for all kinds of state-of-the-art analyses. Um, in addition to the Apollo missions, there were, of course, as I mentioned, three lunar missions between 1970 and 1976. And those missions were robotic missions. So the Apollo missions, of course, were human missions and astronauts actually collected those materials, but the lunar missions were uh, robotic missions. And they, uh, you can see in light pink, uh, some of the areas of the moon on the right-hand side here, and, I, and hopefully maybe you can see the mouse maybe uh, of my cursor, but in pink on the right side here, the Luna 16, 20, and 24, uh, these missions brought back something like uh, uh, 0.32 kilograms, actually, so 320 grams or so of lunar samples. So that's a little bit of a typo there in my slide. And then most recently, of course, um, uh, Changi mission, which was sent by the Chinese, it landed in December 2020, and they brought back 1.7 kilograms of lunar samples and the landing site for, for that mission is shown here in the red dot on the upper left. So all of these landing sites, they all are on the near side of the moon. And they all actually, if you look at the face of the moon, there are, you know, of course, the dark portions, which are called Mare, and the lighter portions, which are called Highlands. And all of the landing sites, most of them actually, uh, are in the dark regions. And maybe a few that are, Apollo 16, for example, is in the Highlands region, and some that overlap Highlands and, 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 uh, and Mare regions of the moon. But all of them are actually on the near side, not from the far side. So the Apollo and Luna samples, of course, here are just some uh, images showing uh, some examples of the kinds of materials that we have. Here on the left-hand side, you can see these big rocks from that were brought back by the Apollo missions that are being handled in a glove box in a very clean environment at the NASA Johnson Space Center, the Lunar Laboratory. And much of the 382 kilograms that I mentioned that was brought back uh, by the Apollo missions, much of that is still preserved and much of that is still available for um, lots of types of investigations. And in fact, um, as the technological advances continue to be made, there's better and better analytical techniques and in the 50 or so years since these samples have been brought back, we've actually been able to learn a lot more from these samples. And in fact, just this past year, uh, there was actually a um, lunar core sample that had been sealed for the last, you know, over decades. It had never been opened and it was actually opened up just in this last year and new analyses were conducted to better understand some of the uh, history of the of these lunar samples. And um, there's actually still some investigations that are being done on, on that new, new newly opened material. So, you know, it's a treasure trove of materials that are still continuing to reveal the secrets of the moon. On the right side, of course, you see also um, a few fragments here. So this is, um, you can see it's a small, uh, small, millimeter sized fragments here of some of the Luna 16 um, samples and uh, they have been studied extensively as well. And here, of course, uh, in December of 2020, I'm showing you the canister that was returned by the Changi 
five mission uh, by the Chinese and uh, the 1.7 or so kilograms of material, they're only just starting to study those. And it's thought that actually, you know, the region of the Mare that was sampled by this particular mission, it might actually be significantly younger basalts than some of the basalts that we were brought back that were brought back by the Apollo and the Luna missions. And so it might reveal some interesting um, geological um, facts about, about the moon as and when we start to study these materials. So I'll tell you a little bit, of course, about the kinds of uh, materials that we have in our collections. Uh, and I'll uh, tell you a little bit about the Apollo samples that we have. Uh, much of the, uh, there actually there's quite a lot of what we call regolith that was collected from the, um, from the surface of the moon in these Apollo missions. And the regolith is basically just, and this is a close-up image of one of the boot prints um, on the moon from Apollo 11. And you can see that the material is actually very, very fine grained and very, very powdery. And in some places on the moon, this kind of regolith can actually be meters to sometimes a few kilometers thick. And so um, this type of material was produced as a result of lots and lots of impacts over the last you know, billions of years in the history of the moon. And so it basically broke uh, the surface of the moon into tiny, tiny little fragments. Um, and in fact, really some, some of it is very, very finely powdered materials. And so, um, you know, a lot, a lot of the surface of the moon is covered with this regular types of, of materials. Um, the other kinds of uh, samples that we have from the Apollo missions are uh, representing the, the very bright portions of the moon. And here actually what I'm showing you on the upper right side is the far side of the moon, which was also imaged by the Apollo um, spacecraft as it was orbiting around the moon. And so we, you know, we were able to see, of course, the far side, um, and we saw that it was actually mostly made up of these very heavily cratered ancient bright terrain. And so we have Here actually samples that are sort of lighter colored samples that are made up of mineral called Thanks to the observations, we now have not only unprecedented views of its surface, but a whole new tour of the moon that shows how both it and other rocky planets in our solar system have been shaped over billions of years. And so this mineral is very light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It does not have a lot of light colored. It and we think that it might be the oldest sort of flotation crust of the moon as it was forming. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but basically the highlands are thought to be the oldest crust uh, of the moon, probably 4.4 billion years or older. And it has been pulverized by impacts uh, to produce rock types that are called gretches because they are sort of mixtures of broken up uh, broken up rocks. So here uh, is a rock that's shown here. It's an example of an Apollo 16 uh, lunar breccia that we think originated in some of these kind of bright portions of the moon. And then of course, uh, and here's an image on the upper right side of the near side of the moon. And you can see sort of the darker regions which are called Amare. And these are the volcanic plains. And we believe that they formed after the ancient highlands crust was formed and after some of the largest impacts that produced these very, very large circular basins on the moon. And uh, the ages of these uh, Mare basaltic materials uh, in the Apollo collection ranged from about 2.7 to 3.8 billion years old. Um, some of these are thought to be much younger actually, and but these were not sampled by the Apollo missions. And it'll be really interesting to see, you know, the Changi uh, 5 uh, Mare samples that are brought back because it's thought that maybe they come from portions of the Mare that may be something like 2 billion years old. Um, these are made up, of course, of very fluid magma, basaltic in composition. It's called a basalt. It's mainly uh, made up of darker minerals, uh, iron bearing minerals called pyroxene uh, and olivine. And uh, this type of uh, magma actually erupted in very you know, vast quantities and filled these pre-existing basins 
um, that were formed by impacts, which is why you see, which is why we see that they're actually sort of these kind of very smooth, flat plains that seem to fill in some of these impact basins. So they're sort of circular outlines because they're filling in these impact basins. And here's an example of an Apollo 11 basalt that's shown here. And again, you can see that it's sort of a dark color here. The other sort of unique material that we have brought back in the Apollo uh, samples are these volcanic glasses, um, or vo actually volcanic beads because they're spherical. And some of them are glassy as, uh, as shown on the left-hand side here, the green ones, and also some of the orange ones that are, that are shown in the middle. Um, and they range, as you can see, in color uh, from green to about orange to somewhat blackish. And that depends on their chemical composition and how much titanium, for example, there is in these glasses. But these we think were actually produced by fire fountaining on the moon. Um, you know, just like we have these basaltic eruptions in Hawaii, and I've shown a picture of that on the upper right side, there were actually some fire fountains like that happening on the moon very, very early in its history. And so these glasses were produced as a result of some of the, some of the fire fountaining that happened. And in fact, uh, some of the images from the moon, you know, when we look at the pictures of the moon that were returned by the Apollo uh, missions, it looks very sort of gray and different shades of gray. But if you actually look closely at some of the Apollo 17 images, particularly in a region called Shorty Crater, you can actually see that there is some orange colored soil. And you can see that in the uh, lower right here. And there's this kind of orangish soil. And um, Jack Schmidt, who actually was one of the only, he was the, actually the only geologist among all of the astronauts that walked on the moon, there were you know, 12 astronauts that actually walked on the surface of the moon in all of the Apollo missions. Um, most of them were actually um, uh, basically military um, aviation uh, personnel, but Jack Schmidt was actually a geologist. And he, it, you know, it was on the Apollo 17 mission that we, you know, when he saw that orange soil, he was super excited when he saw it because it was telling us something extremely um, you know, important about the history of the moon. And it turned out to be actually uh, that these were these volcanic uh, beads. And there's actually a lot that we've learned from them. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a little bit. So, so those are all of the kinds of you know, Apollo samples that were brought back. The Luna materials were actually quite similar um, in terms of representing uh, the Mare and Highlands types of materials. Um, and uh, of course, there was a, a, a lot smaller quantity of those, but the Apollo materials, of course, were the um, you know the, the, the largest fraction of lunar materials that we that we have until, of course, uh, we started to find lunar meteorites. And these were actually so the the reason why lunar meteorites are are important to study as well is because, as I mentioned, all of the spacecraft missions that have sampled the moon. And I'm not showing, you know, Changi 5 here, which is located in the upper uh, left corner here. Um, they sample a very small fraction of the moon. And so if you were to actually draw a, you know, uh, the outline of all of the areas that are sampled by the Apollo missions and the Luna missions, it only represents about 9% of the surface of the moon. And if you include Changi, of course, that increases maybe to about 20%, but that's that's still a very small fraction of the moon surface that you know, we've covered in sampling these, um, these materials with these missions. And also, of course, I mean, there are no samples that we have from the far side of the moon. They're all from the near side. And as we know from previous spacecraft missions, the far side is actually looks very different from, from the near side. And so we're only really sampling a very small fraction of the moon from these spacecraft missions. Um, so lunar meteorites actually give us a way to study um, a much more random sample of the surface or the crust of the moon. And we basically... Um, understand at this point that, um, you know, there were obviously lots of impacts on the moon and some of the rocks that were impacted, lunar rocks that were impacted actually were impacted with, with such force that they actually attained uh, lunar escape velocity, which is about 2.4 kilometers per second. 
And so it launched these moon rocks out into space. And because Earth, of course, is the closest to the moon, much of the material that was ejected from the moon ends up landing on the Earth as meteorites. And so we think that the time between uh, launch from the moon as a result of impacts to landing on the Earth, typically for these lunar meteorites takes potentially, you know, sometimes as, as little as 100 uh, years or so, and as at most about 20 million years. So it's a very quick transit time between the uh, moon and the Earth for these meteorites uh, from the moon. Um, what we do know about lunar meteorites at this point is that you know there are something like 471 named lunar meteorites or meteorites that are recognized as lunar as of just a, you know a couple of days ago i guess that that was a count for these lunar meteorites and the total mass of this material that we know of at this time is about 756 kilograms there's undoubtedly much more you know of lunar material on the earth that we just haven't discovered yet but uh these are the sort of the statistics for the materials that we that we do know that we that we basically can recognize as lunar meteorites all of these were blasted off from the moon within the last 20 million years and most of them within the last 500,000 years clearly you know there were meteorites from the moon that were falling on the earth before that time but you know the earth is a very um dynamic environment there's plate tectonics there's weathering going on so the materials that actually probably landed before this time um uh, most likely were weathered away and just have not survived the process so um most lunar meteorites we know originated most likely from small craters on the moon so the impacts that caused these uh, materials to be ejected from the surface of the moon and, and, and eventually make their way to the Earth. The kinds of craters that are formed to produce those kinds of ejected uh, lunar crustal rocks are probably only about a kilometer across in diameter. So it's relatively small impacts can produce lunar meteorites. And of course, we believe that they come from random locations on the moon because meteorites, of course, impact the moon um, and the, with the same probability in different locations. And so we think that they came from different locations, random locations on the moon. Um, the annual mass flux of lunar material, so this means basically the total material from the moon that we estimate falls on the earth every single year is about <laughs> is in the range of about 10 to 1,000 grams of material every single year. So there's actually quite a lot of lunar material that probably has accumulated on the earth over time. Um, what we don't know about these meteorites, of course, is the exact source crater on the moon, where they came from. You know, for the for the Apollo samples and Luna samples, we know exactly where these rocks were picked up by the astronauts or by the spacecraft. And but in the case of these lunar meteorites, of course, we have absolutely no idea where the impacts occurred that resulted in the formation of these meteorites that eventually came to the Earth. Um, but you know the advantage, of course, as I said, is that uh, they give you a much more random sampling of the moon. So lunar meteorites, as I mentioned, are, there's a total of about 471. Most of them, actually, all of the ones that we know of at the current time, they have been found in the desert regions of the Earth. And um, you can actually see the white bars are lunar meteorites that were collected in Antarctica. And the very first lunar, lunar, lunar meteorites were actually collected by the Japanese in 1979. And so uh, they were collected as early as that, but they were not recognized as lunar till sometime in the mid 1980s. Um, and, and basically what this graph also shows you is that the number of lunar meteorites that are, have been collected just in the last, I would say, couple of decades far exceeds all of the ones that have been collected since the 1980s or so. And so we're continuing to find new lunar meteorites and most of them from the desert regions of the world. And, um, and of course, Antarctica was the first place where these meteorites were found. Um, and you know, there's a couple of reasons why it's easy to find meteorites in Antarctica. And I've been part of expeditions that have been down there to collect meteorites and the reason, of course, is because, you know, you have white ice sheets and you see these meteorites that are dark objects typically sitting on the surface and they're easy to find. And then, um, you know, Antarctica is a very kind of unique place also in that it actually has 
uh, a unique mechanism, almost like a conveyor belt mechanism, which carries along these meteorites uh, on these ice sheets on which they've fallen until they abut against some kind of mountain range. And then they collect in these zones called stranding surfaces. And so you can actually find concentrations of meteorites in Antarctica. Um, in you know just maybe hundreds of meteorites in an area that might be the size size of a of a hockey field <laughs> so um lots of meteorites to be found there and of course the first lunar meteorites were actually found in antarctica um as i mentioned you know first ones in 1979 that were not recognized as lunar until the mid 1980s the first meteorite that was actually recognized as a lunar meteorite definitively was actually uh, one that was found in the 1981-82 field season in Antarctica. And this is the Allen Hills 81005 um, lunar meteorite. And, and this was actually, um, you can see that it's, it's, a, it's what we call a breccia, meaning that it's a mixture of broken up rock fragments from different types of rocks. And you can see some of the lighter rock fragments that are more mainly anorthositic made up mainly of this mineral called anorthite, which I mentioned before, uh, an iron poor mineral, lighter mineral. And it's got sort of mixed in there, darker portions as well that are broken up fragments of some, some of the sort of Mari types of materials. Um, and this lunar meteorite, you know, it was recognized in 1980, 1982 or so as being a lunar meteorite. And that was important because, you know, that was around the time when there was discussion happening in the um, meteorite community about the possibility that there might actually be meteorites from other planets, not just um, uh, the moon here, but there were some group of meteorites that we thought may have come from Mars. And the argument up until the point that we basically were able to find that, you know, there are actually meteorites possible from the moon, the argument was that you know that it was very hard dynamically to eject uh, rocks from planetary bodies uh, and have them fall on the Earth. And so when this first lunar meteorite was found, and um, basically it was from comparing this rock with the Apollo samples that we had in our collections that we were able to make a definitive determination that this was a lunar meteorite, uh, we were able to make that leap and say, well, you know, we can get meteorites on the moon. And certainly, you know, there's a possibility that then we can have meteorites from Mars. And in fact, that's, it's now been shown that in fact, we do have meteorites from Mars as well. And so really, uh, it was an important find uh, in Antarctica to find this first lunar meteorite. And since then, of course, as I mentioned, there's nearly 500 or so known lunar meteorites with many hundreds of kilograms of total lunar material represented among the meteorites. So here are some other examples, and these are sort of uh, chunks of lunar meteorites that have been cut and polished, so you can see the interior of these, of these samples. And most of these lunar meteorites are what we call regolith breccias. So they're broken up fragments that come from um, the compacted portions of the lunar regolith or the surface materials. And so that's what makes up much of these lunar meteorites that we have in our collections. This is what many of them look like. Um, in terms of sort of comparing the chemical composition and makeup of these lunar meteorites, and he here's just sort of a graph uh, showing the chemical composition on the y-axis. You can't actually, it's a little bit cut off here, but that's an element called thorium. And it's a very trace constituent. And that tells us something about the uh, geochemical evolution of the magmas from which these rocks actually formed. And we can actually see the uh, blue squares that are distributed all over the place here. Um, they have a very sort of wide range of concentrations of this trace element, uh, as well as a wide range of concentrations of iron oxide, which is shown on the x-axis here. Uh, and so the bulk composition, the bulk chemical composition of lunar meteorites actually has a huge range. And the colored sort of fields that are shown here, these are the range of compositions of rocks and soils actually from the Apollo missions uh, shown as A17, A16, A11, Apollo 11, Apollo 15. All of these are sort of 
the regions of composition defined by the Apollo samples, and there's some lunar samples in here too, but they have somewhat distinctive compositions, but they don't have as wide of a range as the lunar meteorites do, and that's to be expected because I'm, as I mentioned, you know, the Apollo samples and the lunar samples only come from a very small fraction of the moon, moon surface, whereas the meteorites, of course, are a random sampling and they give us a better overall picture of what the moon is actually made of. So let's get back then to sort of talking a little bit about what, what have we learned from studying these moon rocks? What are the great insights that we've uh, gained from analyses of these rocks? Uh, the Apollo, the lunar samples, all of these materials that were returned by spacecraft, as well as the lunar meteorites. So the first thing, and I'll talk, talk about maybe my top four uh, facts about the moon that we've learned from these rocks. Number one is that the moon was not born cold. By that, I mean that, you know, the, there were ideas about the moon, moon's formation history before we ever landed on the moon, which suggested that maybe it just sort of a was an agglomeration of solid materials that were present in the early history of the solar system that just accreted or accumulated uh, cold in, in that there was no heating, uh, there was no melting. And that what we would find when we got to the moon was that it was basically a primordial object that never heated up. But what we know from studying the lunar samples is that the moon actually experienced extreme um, you know, heat. Uh, it actually has an internal structure that's very similar actually to the earth in terms of having an iron nickel core, although the iron nickel core is very much smaller than for the earth. It has a denser <clears throat> silicate mantle, and then it has a lighter silicate crust. And from studying these moon rocks, and actually on the left-hand side, you there are, there's like a little Petri dish shown here that has some of these fragments of lunar samples. And there's actually a little bit of a scale bar that's shown here that shows a uh, little millimeter sized notches that you can see. So the, most of these fragments are a few millimeters across here. And there are some light and some dark uh, fragments. And just from studying some of the lighter fragments here, people could basically, geologists inferred that, you know, there was this anorthite mineral that made up some of these rocks on the moon. And in fact, um, there was a geologist by the name of John Wood who took this giant leap from studying these tiny fragments of white material in the Apollo 11 um, regolith. And basically he was able to infer that maybe these light things actually came from the highlands of the moon. And we hadn't sampled the highlands at that point, uh, you know, from Apollo 11, but he made that inference. He said he had the hypothesis, the lunar highlands would be made up mostly of this anorthite rock. And, uh, and that it was because originally there was maybe a, a big magma ocean on the moon, meaning that when the moon originally formed, most of its surface was completely molten and that you started to form this early crust of lighter silicate mineral called anorthite, which floated up to the top and formed this anorthositic crust uh, early in the history of the moon. And that's why you have these kind of lighter fractions. And then, and then of course, we, you know, we think that there were impacts and, and it broke through, the impacts broke through that anorthositic crust and that there was, there was a magma that flowed through to form the mare after that. And so, Basically, we learned that the moon had a very, very sort of hot history uh, and was probably mostly all molten, actually, at one stage. And that was actually the birth of the lunar magma ocean hypothesis. And now we understand that, in fact, probably most of the terrestrial planets underwent this kind of magma ocean uh, phase in their history. The Earth may have been through that, too, actually. Maybe Mars did, too. And so it's only from the moon and studying moon rocks, though, that those ideas actually came to be. Um, the moon also, the other thing that we've learned about the moon is, is that it's recorded uh, the history of uh, impacts in the Earth-Moon system. And in fact, there's you know, one really big question related to that, but that we're still actually trying to decipher. So you can see these two um, sort of curves that are shown here which basically graphically show 
uh, the number of impacts hitting the moon on the on the y-axis and time before present on the x-axis. So four and a half billion years ago, which is on the left-hand side of this graph, we think that there was a, a very much higher flux of materials, uh, asteroids and comets that were hitting the moon. And with time, as we approach the present day on the left hand, on the right hand side of this graph, the number of impacts actually declined very, very sharply with time. Um, the idea that was born from studying some of these Apollo samples in particular was that maybe around 3.9 billion years ago, there was a lunar cataclysm, meaning that there was a huge spike in the impacts. And that's shown by this red dashed line that this lunar cataclysm happened about 3.9 billion years ago. And that's again, you know, from studying the Apollo samples, we have a lot of ages uh, that were ages that were determined on some of these rocks that seem to give 3.9 billion years as the age. And we think that maybe that marks the time that was, there was a huge spike in these impacts. However, there's a big debate about that. And in fact, from studying, you know, lunar meteorites, we are starting to see that maybe there was maybe there might not have been a spike, that it was just a smooth decline from a very high rate of impacts early on to a low rate of impacts. And the interesting thing is that the Apollo samples, of course, come from a very small portion of the moon. And so maybe that particular portion of the moon has been heavily affected by impacts, whereas the lunar meteorites have not. So this has a lot of really, you know, interesting implications, meaning that, you know, Earth, life on Earth started, we think, right around that time, you know, maybe three or so, three and a half billion years ago. And impacts would have, you know, the rate of impacts would have affected uh, whether life could have survived this type of impact history early in, its, um, in the history of the Earth. And so this is a very interesting question that we are still actually trying to answer at the current time, whether there was a lunar cataclysm or if there was just a steady decline in, in the impact history of, um, of the Earth and the Moon. But we can learn something about, again, that kind of history from studying these rocks. Um, number three is that we've learned from studying the chemistry and the mineral composition of the Moon rocks that, in fact, the Moon itself was probably born as a result of a giant impact of a Mars-sized object on to the early earth, close to about 4.5 billion years ago. And so this is called a giant impact hypothesis and it's a leading idea that we think resulted in the formation of the moon. Um, and in fact, some recent studies have shown that these kinds of impacts, early impacts between large bodies early in the history of the solar system, you know, in the case of the earth and the moon, there was actually probably a whole, um, vapor cloud around the Earth that was produced as a result of this impact. In fact, some uh, dynamical studies have shown that this vapor cloud was like kind of a donut shaped with Earth in the center. And then the moon emerged from this cloud of vapor, rocky vapor. And, um, and so it, again, of course, it makes sense because the moon did have, in fact, a very hot phase, a lunar magma ocean phase. And we think that a lot of the geochemical and and, and um, uh, isotope characteristics that we see on these, in these lunar samples can be explained by this giant impact origin of the moon. And so that's something kind of, you know, <laughs> we, you know, before the Apollo samples, before we had these lunar meteorites, you know, to study very carefully, we really had no idea how the moon came to be. There were lots of ideas about, you know, how the moon might have formed. Maybe it was a captured object. Uh, you know, captured by the earth, or maybe it was, you know, from, you know, fission of the earth, separating out of a, you know, portion of the earth as it was, as the earth was forming, or maybe the earth and moon sort of accreted, agglomerated, you know, at the same region of the solar system about the same time. So there were all these other ideas about how the moon formed. But as a result of studying these samples, we now believe that this is the idea um, the giant impact hypothesis. This is the idea of how we think the moon came to be. Uh, finally, you know, and this is something that we've only realized from studying uh, these uh, lunar rocks, including these volcanic beads that I talked about earlier. Um, just in the last 
you know, decade or decade and a half because of the analytical advances that have been made. And the techniques are such that we can now detect much smaller abundances of volatile elements and water abundances. We can now see that in fact, some of these lunar samples had maybe tens of parts per million of water and other types of volatile elements. And you can see on the graph on, on the right-hand side, the green are the green glass bead analyses, the orange squares are the orange glass bead. And on the x-axis is the abundance of water in parts per million, with part per million being basically the abundance in one times 10 to the negative six, um, one times 10 to the six actually, um, just like percentage, weight percent, of course, if we talk about weight percent, that's you know one in a hundred. So this is, we're talking about one in a million. So it's small abundances of uh, water, but you know, there's tens of parts per million water, which you know, we didn't think there was any water in any of these moon rocks when we first brought them back and were, they were first studied. But now we realize that in fact, some of these lunar rocks actually had measurable quantities of water. And we can basically infer that the mantle of the moon actually some portions of the mantle of the moon may actually have as much water as some portions of the mantle of the earth. And so the moon's not quite as dry as we thought it was. And so the ideas about its formation history have to include, uh, have to include that idea as well. So I'm going to be wrapping up now pretty soon. Um, I hopefully was able to tell you a little bit of a, um, a story about what we know about the moon from studying these moon rocks. Um, basically, these rocks, the moon, the rocks that we brought back from the moon, they have the story of the moon written in them. And, and we only have, as geologists, we have to decipher that story. And the interesting thing is that really the moon itself is, is we can think of it as a Rosetta Stone, meaning that it provides a clue to deciphering the earliest history of not just the moon, but also the earth's early history. Because as you know, as we understand it, the oldest rocks on the earth date back to maybe 4 billion years. And there's maybe some mineral fragments that are older than that, but there are no preserved rocks on the earth, whole rocks that um, are older than about 3.9 or 4 billion years. And so, the moon rocks, which are older than that, actually um, can potentially tell us something about the earliest history of the moon. Um, and that's because, as I mentioned, you know, of course, the Earth has a very dynamic surface. There's plate tectonics, there's weathering. There's nothing really, again, that's preserved that's older than 4 billion years. Um, you know, the Earth and the moon both, we, you know, went through some period of early bombardment and it could have been a heavy bombardment that declined steadily or maybe there was a spike at 3.9 either way there was a much heavier you know bombardment history early on and so you know the questions are you know when did life originate on the earth did it originate multiple times on the earth and there's the hope that maybe some of the ancient uh, moon rocks might preserve some possibly some fragments of earth rocks that were transported to it as meteorites perhaps. And so maybe sometime in the future, if we go back to the moon and we, and we uh, sift through some of the you know, larger quantities of, of, of moon regolith, we might find small fragments of earth rocks there that could tell us something about the earliest history of the earth. Um, so really there's a lot of potential for future discoveries. So I will end here. Um, by saying that you know there's still a lot more to explore on the moon, and um, maybe there's one of you out there who one day will have boot prints on the moon. So um, this is this is a really exciting time, and you know there's many uh, nations, including the United States and, and China and, and India, of course, that are very interested in future exploration of the moon, and hopefully we'll be going back to the moon as well very soon. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude my, my uh, lecture and hopefully if there's any questions, I'm happy to take them. Oh yeah, thank you. Uh, it was really amazing and wonderful talk. Uh, I need not to say that it is uh, quite evident. And uh, as you said, uh, while concluding this, that 
uh, I think many students particularly, they will get inspired. And uh, some of them, or maybe at least one of them, as you said, they will be able to leave their foot, uh, boot prints on the moon. Uh, I think many people from India, now Rizal and Indian said, yeah, they are uh, increased and they're going there. So hope uh, now space tourism and then uh, Indian lunar mission, manned mission, uh, they will soon be uh, there. So now I think, uh, Rajesh, till you find some questions from Facebook, uh, uh, I don't know whether my uh, voice is clear or not because I was told there was some disturbance in my uh, setup. I don't know what has happened because I checked. Uh, I don't feel uh, myself, but maybe uh, a problem over there. One, uh, one question is, uh, which is the latest meteorite found and when? That's uh, a good question. You know, there are new lunar meteorites being found uh, and discovered just about every single day at this point. Many of them, as I mentioned, are currently being collected in the desert regions of the earth. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, there's actually new lunar meteorites being discovered, um, you know, even as I speak, I mean, there's, there's, there's lots of, lots of uh, you know, moon meteorites that are discovered every year. And so, um, the, you know, they're basically, um, classified by geologists, and then uh, they have their official sort of name name that's given to them by a nomenclature committee of the Meteorological Society. And so uh, I cannot tell you the exact name, but yeah, they're they're being discovered all the time. New ones. Okay, uh, if my voice is not clear, uh, Dr. Minash, I'll because you can see the chat box. There's one more question: uh, What data do we have? regarding water on the surface of moon. Let me see, actually, if I, maybe I can stop sharing and I, because I, otherwise I cannot. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yes. Oh, okay, I okay, see. Okay, you, you can. Yeah. What data do we have regarding water on the surface of the moon? Yeah, so that that's a very interesting yes. question. There's, you know, there's the data that we have from studying these moon rocks, um, which is telling us that there has to be some um, small quantity of water in these rocks as a result of, you know, some water being inside the moon. And, and so when it melted, you know, some of the interior of the moon melted, it brought some of that water up into these uh, lavas that were forming on the surface. But there are other spacecraft that, um, you know, remote spacecraft that are orbiting the moon that have also told us that in fact, there are regions of the moon on the surface that might have water ice on the surface, particularly in some of the permanently shadowed regions near the polars, uh, polar portions of the moon, uh, you know, near the South Pole Lake and Basin, for example, on the moon. Um, there might actually be deposits of water ice. Um, that water probably was deposited there because, you know, of, of comets hitting the moon that brought icy uh, materials and then because they're permanently shadowed regions, they actually are like cold traps. They never actually warm up uh, to any significant degree. And so water gets trapped in these regions. And so, you know, there's, there's water on the moon in the interior, which is recorded by these uh, studies that have been done on these moon rocks. But then there's also water on the surface of the moon that we know uh, exists there because of, um, you know, asteroids and, and, and comets uh, that, potentially bring water to the surface of the moon. Okay, uh, I have one question if I am clear the really audible. Uh, uh, so this, you have shown uh, mo most of them were in Northern Afri Af Africa, about 352 of them out of 471. Is there any specific reason uh, in Antarctica or maybe North Africa? Is there any specific reason? Whether uh, we are able to find more over there or um, I hope I'm understanding your question correctly. Again, you were breaking up a little bit, but hopefully I understood your question. Your question was, why is it that we find lunar meteorites predominantly in North Africa um, and, and some of this? Yeah. So the reason is that, you know, these meteorites are actually better preserved in the desert regions because 
again, the earth's surface, you know, there's water, there's oxygen, there's lots of weathering going on, but the desert regions of the world, particularly places in North Africa um, and including Antarctica, actually, these are desert regions that have very low rates of precipitation. And so meteorites that land in these places over time, of course, you know, they don't, they don't experience so much weathering from lack of water in these regions. And so uh, they survive much better. And of course, it's easier to spot these rocks that, and you know, meteorites typically will have this kind of dark rind on them called a fusion crust because that's what happens when they fall through the Earth's atmosphere and the outside gets heated up, but the interior doesn't. And so it sort of the outside gets uh, molten and produces this kind of fusion crust. And so that dark rind actually really stands out against a very you know, light colored surface, like a you know, desert pavement that you find in North Africa and also you know, in Antarctica. So, I mean, I think basically it's easier to find these meteorites in the desert regions because they survive better, they are preserved better. And of course people are, you know, they know that they can actually find these things in these places much more easily. And so they're actually making an effort to go and collect them in these places as well. So we're seeing many more meteorites from these desert regions as a result of that. Uh, there's one more question in the chat box. Uh, yeah, so what is the possibility of building a colony on the moon? Um, I think you know we, we need we need we need to go back to the moon. Uh, you know, obviously, to try to see if we can create the infrastructure that's needed. Uh, you know, basically, we would have to get the resources locally because we can't really carry everything that we need to the moon. If we have, you know, to have a sustainable, uh, a sustainable way to live on the moon for us humans, we actually need to have some sort of basic infrastructure. We need to be able to have oxygen to breathe. We need building materials to, you know, build uh, shelters and all of that requires some degree of technological development that you know we are still doing that, but I don't think that we're currently capable of actually uh, living off the land really <laughs> on the moon, but we're getting there. You know, I think there's been a lot of research that's being done at the current time. I know that there's a lot of interest, of course, in humans going back to the moon. And so, of course, in the United States, we have now what's called the Artemis program, um, where the goal is to land humans on the moon within the next four years. And so we, we'll see if, you know, if that comes to pass and, and, uh, and that's going to be a start, you know. And so there'll be uh, the effort to try to do what we call in-situ resource utilization, meaning that we'll be using things like the ice in the polar regions uh, to maybe generate breathable oxygen um, and drinkable water. Maybe we'll use the lunar regolith to uh, build some building materials for shelters and things like that. And so, you know, I don't know when we'll be able to actually start to live on the moon, but it'll, it'll probably be a, a while, maybe in, in another century or so. So I see this, this uh, I think, uh, another question here. Um, uh, would you like to take it because it's already now 8.31, as you yeah. said, perhaps. Uh, yeah, I do actually have to have to go. Um, I will just ask, uh, yeah. answer one quick question that's about microorganisms or life on the moon. And I can yeah. tell you that there is Please. no evidence of any kind of microorganisms or, or, or life on the moon. <laughs> so, um, oh, okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, but what we'll do, maybe we'll note down some of the questions uh, from chat box and uh, mail it to you. And uh, when uh, at you're taking your own time, you can answer to them. Absolutely. Uh, uh, let me thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I know it is at a very short interval, but somehow it happened. In fact, uh, Mr. Bharat Adur, uh, he was supposed to join, but he uh, could not. So, it's a really big thank you, but hope that we will come back to you and more uh, uh, listen from you. In 52 minutes, perhaps you will summarize. But yeah. A big thank you to you. It was Absolutely. really amazing uh, and interactive.
Thank you okay. so much. I really appreciate yeah. it. And thank you. Our, yeah, thank you. And thank you, our audience. Uh, we had some technical glitch, so we are really uh, uh, sorry for that. But the lecture will be available on YouTube as well as on our Facebook. Uh, those who have missed or could not join, please do watch and send your feedback over there. Till then, stay safe. Okay, take care of yourself. Thank you.